Be accepted. Uh, let's now move to Judith. Morena, Phil Murray. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, good morning. Uh, we've got, I think, pretty much all the executive team here today to so answer the questions. That's all that I can talk about from the Chief Executive Report. But I'll take the report as read, and what I will do is just uh, make a couple of highlights. Um, so, first of all, I'd just like to um, bring your attention to the um, now, I hope, and program where we take our full support regularly from things over to 100 and for uh, um, an assessment process uh, currently 100 applicants. Uh, we should take a significant time from our um, CEP to audit our key leaders to go through that and so we to achieve that focus. So August has seen us achieve and uh, we'll get to the point of the 12 month cycle compared to the uh, start of the lockdown in 2021 and um, COVID and the lockdown. But now we will start to see, hopefully, uh, which is quite a uh, significant increase in the 12 month role in Patridge and um, public transport. Um, last month uh, we were at around 60 or 62 percent for pre COVID levels. Um, last week was our second. That's uh, now getting towards 68, 69% of pre-COVID um, pre levels, which 
not quite to the world we want to be, but it's certainly uh, probably the biggest step we've seen over the two week period. Um, we are still behind with regards to one from Christchurch, and uh, we are starting to catch up. So we're around 15 percent behind Christchurch. Um, on page 12 and 13 of the report, um, simply there's pretty much every month, but I uh, just point out um, which is pretty amazing that we've got a lot of slips. Um, over the last five months, that's taken 12.6% major weather event around this time last year. So we've hit um, seven loads, we overwhelmed the Henry Plains with the new causeway um, in northwest Auckland. And um, just a quick update um, on page 15 of the report with regards to the Upper Harbour Drive cycle work. Um, so, following the uh, deputation of the meeting uh, last month, um, I've spoken to Councillor Walker. Um, uh, chair and Deputy Chair, and also um, our immediate Louisa White, the local board chair, um, and the Green Way for the Broad Road Crossing, which is um, a community engagement to look at the design of the cycle and separate it. And the first workshop will be, both workshops actually, I think, on the phone. And um, we've, Andrew and I have seen the proposed options around design, I'm pretty comfortable with where we're going on that. Um, and I've also been engaged. September. Um, uh, that's uh, quite an important piece of infrastructure, a uh, park and ride for um, the walking community, and that's been built for by a lot of the time of the day. And on that note, I'll take the report to Um, we a little. Um, so certainly, for example, Gobus who have had to reduce their schedules um, to because they were probably the most impacted, uh, communicated to us yesterday that we intend to increase um, their schedules back to normal, which is good in the next two weeks. So we're seeing slight improvements. I think the pay rate um, increases up to two grand pay rates over the last two months um, have improved, but we're still around four down and in the single phone session so the correspondence that we've uh, written to the minister asking him to look at the uh, immigration settings which is still not acceptable in terms of increased people so there's still quite a lot of work to do. And the, the People Powered Streets program, uh, let's see if we get two projects successful. Uh, is that what we're expecting or are we a bit disappointed with that? Maybe through the chair I'll have a go on to that one. Uh, we, we submitted four projects in total. We had six that were ready to go that we wanted to submit, but in the end, with the detail and the feedback we had from what we decided, we put four on the table. They obviously opted to nominate two out of that. I think they are a little cautious about perhaps allocating too much of the money to Auckland. Um, but the two that we've got on the table are quite significant projects, mm -hmm. um, and I think will deliver some real benefit back to Auckland. Um, one of them is, is Henderson, and I Forget the other one off the top of my head. I could provide some more detail on those two projects. Thank you. Sarah, yeah, and then and then Mark. Just a couple of questions. Um, just on contents, I see that continuing to rise. I remember some months ago we were working with the council around trying to improve our efficiency in getting those through. Is that progressing? Is that working? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's mm -hmm. the, uh, yeah. 
So um, there's a number of work streams on there. Some of them are around defining process more effectively. Some of them are around, around defining what the teams are actually there to work for so you can create a sense of purpose for the teams. And some of them are around um, IT and technology and how we actually share information and work. So it reports regularly into the CES group um, and now making work for focus. Yeah, we can try and clear up that next time, perhaps. Okay, just another one from a reputational point of view, I see you know, rail, the block of lines, potentially having an impact again on a whole lot of concepts and things coming up. How comfortable or uncomfortable are we at the moment around what that might be as a challenge or uh, a challenge for our reputation, what we're doing to mitigate? I'll take that initially and very yeah. I'll to respond as well. Um, so you can see a paper later on in the closed session around that. And we are very concerned around the impact of the ongoing round of the written package. Um, we've probably done our best in terms of negotiating a better outcome for special events with QRL. And they were proposing effectively to not really offer any um, trade services to any even part um, events. So we've been able to at least um, negotiate with them around the two quarters more kill them, the, the biggest event probably in Auckland over the next 12 months or so. Um, so, we're comfortable as best we can be, and um, we will be reliant on trying to provide some alternative services as well. But in the also the, um, uh, the walking trail, which is the issue the delivery of custom jobs. We rely on those types of negotiations as well. The only thing I'd add is the, it'll come up in the paper when it's presented, the rolling block of line only affects certain parts of the rail network at any particular time. So we'll be operating um, rail bus services to cover those parts of the network that are not operating through to uh, events. What happens when you rebuild a railway line uh, while you're also trying to um, use it as your mass transit to yes. <coughs> Yeah, uh, my first question was actually the same around the rail, just concern around the service levels. But can I add to that? We've got some notes in here just around there's also train manager shortages, not just bus driver shortages. So, um, and metrics of service are coming in a negative trend on them. So, overall, I think we've got some challenges in rail as we're trying to rebuild the DTE. Yeah, actually, um, I think it's the end of this month. Um, and um, AOR expects to be completely um, back at their normal level of train managers, which is good. They um, just completed two schools of train managers training. Um, so but that's good. But look, it's, it's, the, it's the impact from the key role that's it's now having a bigger impact actually than um, staff availability of the train network. The second one was just around just to say well done on the um, cycle separator thing. We don't have the history necessarily of listening to them. Listen and we're kind of reacting. We also want to make sure that the public and media are part of that project as well. Like we have to go out there and actually tell people to listen and get them to change what they do. So, is that in the plan? No, absolutely. Um, so, I might be able to talk about a little bit more, but if we go to a successful outcome of this, I think that's quite a turnaround. And we need to actually make big use of that in the rest of the program, obviously, as well. And actually, like I say, communicate that we have engaged recognising what perhaps we didn't do fully before, um, but we're not quite there yet, as we want to say. There's still some entanglement in the community around it, uh, and there's still some elements of lack of uh, expectation that we will listen. So we've still got a bit of work to do. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Uh, kia ora, Mark. Tēnā koe. Thank you very much for your um, report. I really like the way you um, you've, you've categorised it into all of those um, uh, key um, areas, and I think it sort of uh, gives it a good structure as well. Just wanted to note uh, the efforts of um, uh, Auckland Transport with uh, Tūmiki Te Reo Māori and some of the report there, and, and also uh, promoting te ara, talking about our, our maternal check -up. I think it's a slow, um, but important um, uh, journey uh, that um, that needs to be undertaken to, to gradually and, and strengthen the um, uh, the culture of AT to incorporate um, to all antique So acknowledge that. Um, just wanted to, to make a point about the 
uh, 18 procurements being with Māori owned businesses at 3 million, which um, uh, is uh, positive, but uh, as we all know, a, a very small drop in the overall um, operational expenditure of, um, of AT. So any thoughts about how we can develop, further develop or expand that um, as we move forward and support um, supply diversity? Uh, Mark, and I know that our team were at the recent Ahotai um, uh, social procurement forum as well. So uh, just be keen to, to hear some uh, top of mind sort of thoughts on, on how that can look over the next. Thank you, Jim. Uh, through the Chair, um, the targets we've set at the moment around spring with multi businesses is direct spend. Mm -hmm. And what we're starting to realise as we unpack it a bit more is that a lot of the spend is not necessarily through the big header contracts, but indirect. So we've we're going, to, we're going to try and find a way to start measuring the indirect spend with multi business because it's the, the purpose of a measure like that is ultimately to, you know, as it stimulating normal businesses, etc. And it's at the moment, uh, what we're finding is a lot of those large contracts are mm. non multi businesses. There's a lot in the corporate space, mm. but the, the construction businesses dominate the spend. Mm. Um, so it's a work in progress, but we, you know, the target's important, but also the outcomes we're trying to seek as well as part of that through social mm. procurement will be more important. Thank you. Very, very briefly, Chair. Uh, thanks, thanks for that, Mark. I think um, <coughs> quite right there, there are very few Māori um, owned businesses that are of the scale that can contract directly with um, organisations like AT. And I suppose it's really requiring your, your um, uh, key contractors to you know, indirectly support those Māori businesses. So thank you. Thanks, Mark. I just want to. Let's say congratulations on the remedial works in the north northwest. I think that's really impressive to turn that, that around. Mm -hmm. I'd be keen. I mean, presumably the works were done undertaken by the, the maintenance contractor in that area. And therefore, I think you know if we can capture the lessons learned and good practice around that sort of when when it happens again, um, we, we, you know, we know we know what good, good it looks like and can apply them in the future the areas. So I'm quite keen to make sure that we. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, obviously, we're briefing, being briefing all the time with the, the contractors uh, in that area. So, yeah, we, um, we will absolutely be taking that up. So, through you again, Madam Chair, I, I, just, I would like to acknowledge the recognition that our projects have been getting in the community. Um, mm. It's great to hear that, uh, see that being highly commendable, winning awards, etc., amongst the professionals, professionals we work with. Um, I'm the beautiful bottomly one. Um, thank you, Andrew, for the use this morning for that copy of the acquisition. I'm just a little bit concerned that um, our responsibility is people got letters in 2008 and 2019 saying the copies were required. I think we really have to recognise there's big gaps uh, between when we start this and when we finish up. It sounds as though we might have left a bit of a hole in the comms. Yes, I agree. That wasn't the right response. We'll follow that up uh, through uh, the lines. Um, uh, I'm also <coughs> going to put a tiny back in front of you to talk about it. And we're nowhere near um, that it's been talked in the near term, short term. But it's, it's about that ongoing implementation of the contract. And we've got new arrivals to the mind group where we're at in the process and um, show a lot more effort. So um, you will come back to us at, at the next meeting and just let us know what um, correction has been. Yeah. Um, Kylie and then Izzy. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the report and well done on all the good work. Um, I had got the opportunity to have some insights into temporary traffic management plans during the week and just looking at the inspections we do. Um, and saw the good work that our team and contractors are out there doing, but also understood more the complexity of it. I'm really interested in how we think about vulnerable road users um, in that space, particularly given the temporary nature of what's happening. Um, and I guess I'm also looking at, you think of what happened with Tiata 2 with the cycle underway and what that then meant for vulnerable road users. So I'm just interested in, how we are constantly thinking of about that safety element um, with those temporary traffic management. 
plans and implementation. Yeah, through the chair, happy to respond to that question. Um, so in terms of temporary traffic management, obviously uh, each site has different complexities. So the, the teams try to design within what's called Coptim, the, the standard, uh, a solution for each site. But I think the good news going forward is that with Waka Katahi, we're working on changing the approach to what's called a risk-based approach, which would put more onus on the contractors themselves to uh, do specific temporary traffic management design for, for each site, taking into account the, um, the, the, the types of users at that area, so vulnerable users and so on, and then design the measures so that it would uh, provide safe uh, passage for all types of users through the site. So that's a piece of work that is ongoing in conjunction with Waka Katahi, really looking at how we can do tra temporary traffic management better. So are we providing the necessary leadership and collaboration with our contractors to ensure that that's top of mind? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Andrew's team uh, has a, a core component of overseeing temporary traffic management yeah. across the Auckland networks. So this is very much uh, top of mind, making sure that all road users can safely passage the sites during okay. the event. Thank you. But we'll, we won't see any more social media postings of um, huge signs right in the middle of the cycleway. way. Um, I can't guarantee that you won't see uh, social media postings in the future because the public uh, love to post about our construction sites. But I guess what you can be reassured is that we're taking on board all the feedback we get and uh, continuously improving. Remember, remember it will be vulnerable to being severely damaged. Okay, uh, Izzy. Um, I just wanted to quickly draw attention to the data science and advanced analytics section of the paper, which I just think is a really core capability as we go into this period of a lot of change in our system that we keep that data at the fore. And I think it's really exciting to see those pieces. Do you remember that's tab 12? Is that on? That's the business report. Yeah. Data. Let's, let's deal with that when we get to that. Great. Um, any other comments on the business report? Okay, I just had, a, had um, so thank you for all the comments um, from various board members. Um, I wanted to pick up a small, very small item on page 43 of board books, which was accessibility for New Zealanders. And a there is a new build coming in to um, to basically address a consistent approach to accessibility barriers in New Zealand and to comment that the bill is expected to have long-term consequences for transport. Um, I just wanted to um, make the comment really on the back of the comments that Kylie has been made in, make, making in terms of the theme, that our, um, our transport system in Auckland has to work most for people with the highest levels of mobility challenge, and very often that's people with disabilities. Um, and um, uh, any uh, framework that assists us to do the right thinking um, there, and we've just heard a comment from, from Kylie, is going to be good. So if it ends up that this is going to cost us more, that's actually costing us more in the right areas, which is to make sure that, you know, that our transport system is in great shape. Um, I did note on the on my report uh, <coughs> this morning I counted uh, 96 um, um, cones uh, that was in about um, 500 metres. Now, now that was it was unfortunate there were 96 cones. Uh, the positive, of course, was that there was a very significant cycleway under construction, um, and so that was a really you know that was a um, that was the real positive side um, of all the cones. Um, but actually, that that route took me upstairs, and if I had been a person who was mobility challenged, um, and that was very difficult to transact the route that I that I came. So just going to you know picking up those those themes, we do need to think about um, about people who um, are mobility challenged when we're doing those works, and that would have actually resulted in a slightly different sign um, of the of the surrounding works. 
Um, so that's the that's that that is the kind of thing that we notice uh, all the time as we transact the Auckland system, and inevitably we're going to. Um, have some things which are very, very difficult to solve. That, problem, that one probably was solvable. Um, I'm not going to make a notification of it. I'm sure someone will go and um, walk the route and, and um, see what the issues are there. Um, great to see, um, I just want to call out in particular, um, the Sustainable Business Awards. Um, the finalist uh, for some of the work we've been doing with bus shelters. Um, it's um, it's actually, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's reasonably high maintenance, uh, but it really makes a difference to the amenity and it makes, um, it's sort of, uh, it's great to have some of these hero projects and it's great to see them being um, acknowledged. So if we could just pass on to the environmental team and our um, acknowledgement of that. So let's, uh, those chief executive's report is noted. Let's now move on to the proposed speed limit amendment by law thank you chair i'll just we've got a few guests just give me a second to get them into the room that's all right i might have got a couple of chairs I'll turn over to our executive. Sure. Um, Inspector Scotty Webb, I feel like I'm um, in a high court amongst some <laughs> very esteemed people in this room. Right here. Um, so I'm the road policing manager for Tamaki Makoto, which is um, right across TM, um, so across all the um, motorways teams, the booze buses, the serious crash investigation teams. There are still road policing managers within the districts that looked after teams, so I kind of just overview the whole lot. Yeah. Sorry to have to just sort of run in and go, but today's the um, National Police Memorial Remembrance Day, where we sort of acknowledge the police staff that have been killed or slain in the last year. So um, quite relevant for this district with Matt Hunt. So um, yeah, so that's a whole lot of services on today around the station. So yeah. Sorry, thank, thank you for welcome. Sure, thank you. Um, because of what Scotty's just outlined, I gave him an assurance we'll try and get him out of here by quarter past. So I'm going to modify the approach we take to this table a little so that we can really give Scotty an opportunity to talk to the engagement we've had with police on developing this third tranche of speed. Um, perhaps maybe what I will even do is I might just not do my introduction yet. I might give Scotty an opportunity to talk to probably two things, Scott, if you're comfortable with it. Um, the engagement that we've had with with police over this tranche but probably more more importantly the engagement over the duration from 2018 right through to now working with you on all of the phases this this being the last one that we'll do under the law um, and then perhaps just some commentary on the, the the approach that that you see new zealand police bringing to enforcement to support these changes more broadly cool. is that right yeah absolutely and any other comments you want to make obviously in relation yeah, okay I was actually quite fortunate to be um, to be in this role at the start. So with the first tranche um, that was led out, and um, there was a lot of noise around that at the time, and um, lots of discussions um, with Andrew and his team. I um, mean, there I have to say, in my role as uh, the key partner is um, Auckland Transport. There's Waka Kotahi and Council and those, but Auckland Transport almost um, we're out of path um, backwards and forwards. Um, with their teams coming to our, our bridge base and coming in here. So the partnership's really strong and we can't operate um, without this team. Um, there's no way. Um, so being involved in the first tranche, um, kind of got some experience how it all went. Um, 
and then I've been out at NYQ for my sins. I had to do a little stint in NYQ um, with the uh, COVID team for a while and back into this role. So um, I know that that communication and relationships have been um, sustained in the period I was away. Um, so our whole approach to it is um, it's not to, uh, where, where there are speed reductions, it isn't to go in there and uh, slam people for speeding. You know, one day it was 100 k's and now it's 80 or all the other changes, because that was a lot of the worry in the first time round, was that we looked like it was revenue gathering. So we had a, a we were called a highly visible presence, but if we stopped people, they would be just warned uh, for that four to six week period initially. Um, and we also had some um, lists from uh, AT on the specific road. So our speed camera vans that were deployed there, um, <coughs> they weren't. And if they happened to be in an area, their, um, their tolerance was, was switched off. So it didn't look like we were just going to park a whole lot of speed camera vans and ping people um, for uh, an infringement in the area where there's been a reduction. Um, and I suppose you'll all, um, you know, you'll want to know, well, what are the measures and the success? Well, our latest um, statistics we've got out in terms of um, the fatal crashes, which is a real good indicator, is uh, across um, Tamaki Makoto, uh, this time last year, we're sitting at 52 deaths. And at the moment, we're sitting at uh, 32. Uh, for Auckland City District, um, they often have a smaller uh, count because it's a uh, you know high sort of built up roads. Um, so uh, this time last year um, they were sitting at um, at four. And now it's two. In counties Manukau, um, this time last year there were 24 deaths and they're sitting at 16. Um, so for Waitemata, um, which is Rodney, um, North Shore Waitakere. Uh, they were sitting at uh, 25, and so far it's 10. So, um, you know, there's big variances, and uh, I know there's a whole lot of other indicators around it, but the speed is a big part, as we all know. So when we get those sort of figures, it's like, um, I've actually rung and said, so can you just check those figures uh, again? Because when I started, it wasn't like that. Um, so that's a bit of an indicator across um, in terms of the... Um, you know, the deaths, um, and same with the serious injury crashes, because um, that's a big part of it as well. I mean, we're seeing very similar, I think it was that's here, but very similar reductions right across the board. Um, so 13% reduction across TM. Then, of course, the hardy annual around our, our roots and all that, well, it's, it's going the right way. So maybe just for directors and others at the table. Oh, ribs. Ribs on. Yeah. So we talk about ribs um, is, uh, is R is for restraints, um, I is for uh, impairment, um, B is for distractions like a cell phone and S is for speeds. So that's kind of what we focus on. Um, there are a whole lot of other non rib <coughs> infringements that get written across the, um, particularly across the motorways with, you know, insecure loads and you only got to have 12 cars, nose to tail crashes, but we really focus on the roots, those four key areas. Um, and that's all you'll hear us talk about that all the time. We used to have certain times of the year would say, oh, it's going to be all seat belts and it's going to be all distractions. It's like, not everything all the time. Um, and the biggest push for us is to get the non road policing team to do that work. And a few of you here, um, that, worked with police before, you know, with custody detectives would go out there and um, they've got homicides to investigate, which they have, but at times in their downtime, if they're to and from a meeting, there's an expectation that they will do RIDs as well. And we don't expect some of those teams to do the speed work with all the equipment, but they can certainly write infringements for safety belts and cell phones. So it's kind of a, um, it's more than just the road policing teams. We expect that from the road policing teams. <coughs> really butter. Um, so that's, that sort of ties into the whole um, speed reduction is all of our groups involved in it. So from a police perspective across the end, it's certainly, um, we're certainly supported and can offer that reassurance that, um, you know, the partnership that we've got is pretty strong. And we would have this. Uh, we um, recommend it. Appreciate that.
Madam Chair, if, if you're happy with it to enable Scott to get away, let me take some questions for Scott and then, then I'll do. <coughs> Uh, any uh, comments um, or uh, questions of Scott as well? The two main, two main areas came out of the report from, um, from me. One was um, round lead in that area where we were pulled away from what we were going to do. So well, I think the general argument is clearly it's not quite ready. Uh, it's not quite developed enough for what we were proposing to make sense. And the other area was the Halleck community where there seems to be a disbelief that Steve had anything to do with uh, injury, particularly in the latter one. And in the police experience, is, 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 do you see a difference of what's happening around Halleck to what's, perhaps what's happening? It's funny you say those two areas because uh, as soon as you see it, I know where that's coming from. Um, those reductions are across the board, you know, and there are areas and um, a certain individual in Rodney um, who was stopped for speaking again and you know he faced the signs and all that sort of stuff so you're always going to have those agitators but across the board um, when we first started this there was a lot of you know the staff did get a bit of grief you know it's oh, this is ridiculous and uh, but those anecdotal comments uh, coming in is what they were you know because the staff did get a lot of heat and they stopped people um, and thank God for their one month grace but we're not getting the same amount of um of grief around writing infringements because of the publicity that publicity that you do is real key for us because it's hard for us to do that sort of publicity um, so when we are stopping there's a bit of an education that goes with it so um those areas come under um, the certain catchment areas that i mentioned so there's there's reductions across the board in those areas. So, I mean, that's the message we would go back to those communities with and say, well, hey, something's working. It wasn't before. Um, and, you know, we'll do anything to support an organisation that sort of slows everything down. Uh, that's sort of a message that we, you know, we often say we don't set the speed limits, um, but we support the agencies and road controlling authorities who do will do anything to support uh, just slow because we all i think everyone here knows you know only a couple of k's can result in you know we're talking about four six to eight fatalities you know lives can be saved with just a couple of k's drop in the speed limit so um i've never seen that picture before right across the area you know yet nationally uh Outside of them, it's not going the right way. Um, I haven't got the actual national uh, picture, but uh, I haven't got my glasses on. So, for New Zealand nationally, um, previous year was 236 deaths uh, for that year, uh, that tracking at this time. And so um, now it's at 249. So, they're, they're an increase by six percent so it's kind of with if i may be so bold to say that tm is bucking the trend a little bit in terms of the fatal you know, and serious pressures so yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, that's steps for the whole of new zealand yeah yeah that's the ones i just yeah. read down yeah. there take out the auckland outside auckland you've probably gone up by 20. Awesome. Yeah. yeah 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 essentially kylie um and can i please acknowledge your um Partnership New Zealand Police and Vision Zero um, incredibly engaging. And it's you know great to be able to put the face behind what's um, actually happening in Auckland. So thank you, Scotty. Kylie. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership right through. Um, and I think it's really great to hear that we are seeing the results of quite brave leadership. I'm interested in um, your sentiments around we've heard a lot about nationally there has been pushback around what we're trying to do. I'm interested in the sense around Tamaki Makaro and that social license to continue to do what we're doing, particularly as we are seeing such good results and your impressions around Tamaki Makaro vis-a-vis. -vis sure, it um, <coughs> kind of mirrors what we always say with, with crime. If we get it right in TM, yep. the whole country will be right because, you know, I don't want to sound like an arrogant Aucklander and I come from a smaller Taranaki and Northland is my background, but you know, if we get it right in TM, uh, 
um, and rolled it out across the DM the way we did. And that's sort of the measure, I think, for the rest of the country. It's like all of, you know, most of the resources are here um, with this sort of stuff. And if we can sort of say, well, if it works in Auckland, uh, or TM, which has a urban, you know, built up area and a significant rural yep. mix, and that big horrible black thing that runs through the middle of Auckland, the, the motorway, which yep. is never yep. ended, uh, it's kind of got to work. Um, so, yeah, I remember a deputy commissioner saying if we fail in TM across the board, we'll fail in the country, across the country. There are sometimes there are you know, ups and downs, but generally that's. Um, Thank you. I was just wondering about compliance rates with the newsbeat. So grape seed dead rates have reduced significantly. Do we have more room to reduce them? Like, are we at 50% compliance with speeds? And what is kind of the target in terms of the speed limit reduction areas? Do um, we have data? I'm not sure what that is. In the, so just let me see what, what specifically are you asking for in terms of targets? So we sort of mean like if you've reduced from 70 to 50, for example, I think Upper Harbour Highway was yep. an example, we know that compliance rate with that speed limit is still not great, so there's more room to move it down. Is that something you track? Yes, it is, and I can get that. Well, the exact figures. And just to add to that, so we, we, we do track that as yeah. part of our monitoring and evaluation post implementation yeah. looks at what the compliance curve looks like. Yeah. So I think we do that more than police um, because setting speed limits that are safe and appropriate is not a an end game. We, you know, we'll be constantly reviewing speed limits in locations, traffic patterns, travel patterns. Traffic makeup change constantly, the road <coughs> changes constantly. So, our monitoring in the eval looks at what the compliance curve looks like. And there may be areas across the network that we discover actually we're not getting the compliance there. Is there something more that we need to do to get over and above enforcement, which police look after for us by and large? But are there things that we need to do over and above that? Are there engineering measures that we need to bring in to get the speed down? Or if we got it wrong, do we need to go back and have another look at it? So that is part of our monitoring and eval, and it comes in as part of the, the tail end of the process after each of the implementations and is ongoing. Most of our non routes, um, it's all about compliance, and it's really high. Obviously, if you stop with, with no driver's license, well, yes, you'll get an infringement uh, in way um, if you go and take steps to get your license. But in terms of um, compliance with the grids, we don't offer compliance on those. Um, but I don't think that's a question that's more around. Yeah, yeah. Nathan, um, can probably go on that. Sorry, Chief. Did, did you want to comment quickly on what you're seeing in the monitoring and email with respect to kind of that compliance curve? Yeah, so Andrew's right, we, we are, I guess, tracking. And you've got to allow a bit of time, but it becomes clearer as time goes on. And now we're kind of 24 months in on those, on those 20, 20 pages. Um, the rural, rural road compliance is really, really good. And we've, we've seen that, you know, I think that directly translates to these reductions in fatalities and reductions in serious injuries. Um, the urban compliance is quite patchy. Uh, so in the city centre, we have, you know, we had no cars there really for the last couple of years. And, and now those vehicles are starting to come back and we expect the compliance to get better. But for a while there, we had, um, you know, quite quite large roads with, with hardly any traffic on them. And that was a bit of a, a challenge because we don't feel like it's the right environment to drive drive slower um, and so in the, yeah, in the urban areas it's been a little bit patchy and, and that's exactly where we're looking at the moment trying to see you know we've, we've got a I guess a city that's grown organically some areas are designed differently from other areas and some areas we get really good compliance from day dot and some areas we don't and so I was trying to look at those and think what more can we do as a kind of raising localised community awareness as a working with the police and maybe enforcement if there's a few a few people on, on a few roads um, or as a, you know, as a kind of engineering to make people, I guess, force people a little bit to drive a little bit slower in some areas. So it's definitely an area that we're looking at. Uh, Darren. Thank you. Um, thank you, Scott, for coming in and the team. Um, it's really encouraging to hear that the partnership's strong and um, yeah. it's working well. But I just thought we well, would be in, uh, love to hear your comments on a couple of things. One is um, behaviour change around COVID, what you might have seen on the roads, and then what I think what I don't have to hand is what happened in nationally. Auckland was, as we know, locked down much more severely than the rest of the nation last year, and we're comparing ourselves to a year that we were really concerned about last year. So just checking we're not 
too early in patting ourselves on the back as we compare a very terrible year for Auckland. I don't know whether the rest of the nation had the same increase last year as Auckland did and whether the behaviour you saw on the roads was different in Auckland to the nation because of the amount of lockdown. And secondly, the p police presence that potentially is back on the roads this year because you're not being pulled into all of the COVID response, yeah. including yourself, and whether that might have had quite a big impact this year because there's just more resource on the road. Yeah, road. definitely is for the, the your second question. It might be a little bit early to pat ourselves on the back because uh, what we saw during COVID, you know, was ghost town and um, and you had some crazy speeds, you know, because yeah. it was, wow, you know, I've got a white in this Porsche with a wide open network mm -hmm. to, you know, so, and, and although there weren't many, they were really high speeds, you know, 180 days, um, like the autobahn. <coughs> um, and that petered off for a while, but there's still um, there's still some high speeds, um, particularly in, in TN. Yeah. If, that's, if you said to me, what is the biggest concern? It's, and the concern is in that, um, in the 10K area, yeah. and that's where, the, where <coughs> most people will float them between you know, that speed. The high end ones, but a lot of people, or most people, will go over in that 10k part. And we're trying to get our staff to um, to educate people in that 10k zone. You know, that, that's the, that's a risk area. Um, so I think it's a, yeah, it is a bit early, really, because there's still some. The, the speed is probably the worry. Um, the other indicators are going a lot in the right direction, but speed's still taking a bit more. Um, and the other one was around the presence. Because uh, there is a significant focus nationally, you know, that, um, how do I say this politically correct, you know, if, if you've got a, a leadership team in police that are very focused on um, road policing, see we have an assistant commissioner that heads it up, you get that drive and that person, Bruce O'Brien, influences right across, so there's a big focus um, on that. And I actually remember when I was in MIQ, we, the first tranche, uh, when the community cases sort of did get out, because it was all about stopping them getting into the community. And then when the gangsters came in, Sons of Anarchy came on board and it almost, it, we lost control of it really to try and keep it in. Um, then uh, you saw uh, police being released back. Uh, and what started that was the protests in Parliament. <laughs> and there was 170 staff that I had out of the 300 odd went straight when they went. All to, to Parliament. So there are, there have been, I know it was a year of, a couple of years of so many drains. And you can see it when we have full teams. So our, uh, the boost bus teams, they would average five and a half thousand uh, tests um, in a week. And they did eight and a half thousand uh, when we had a full team. You know, full team for that. So that just shows you what you get those full numbers there. It is always that balance. I mean, I could walk out of here and then we have something significant happen. And so that's why they're trying to sort of say, like, uh, other than road policing staff, it's everyone's responsibility. So we did an audit recently on the non road policing groups around we're saying to you to go out and do road policing, and they'll say, oh, we haven't got the gear. We don't have the dragars and the tests. So, well, what do you need? So they come back with this wish list, and now we're giving it to them to say, well, now you've got no excuses. Uh, so every little team can now be enabled to do road policing. So that's around the numbers and the visibility. Yeah. And we've got those, the, the smaller buses, you know, the smaller truck events, which can are very agile and get about more than those big trucks. The staff like the big trucks because they've got toilets and they're big machines and the nurses can go on board. The smaller ones are more um, agile in terms of deployment, so you'll see a lot more pop up. Yeah. Well, it's been um, incredibly instructive. Um, so particular acknowledgements for police on all the days. I'm not just saying, you know, around all the change, but there is, um, it is a real good relationship. Uh, and often uh, I will ring and ask Auckland Transport for support on stuff, or you'll have the likes of Andrew and his team, or Kim, um, or Stacey that will reach out and prompt us with stuff. So it's um, really good. It's a good relationship. Right.
Thank you. I'm going to put another uniform on now for that yeah, one. Yeah, tough day. Yeah, big and fancy. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. everyone. Yeah, yeah it's good to meet you all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Feel like I need to like in court. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. Yeah, so quite quickly, I mean, that's taken a fair amount of time. Just interested in some guidance from yourself. I'm happy to talk at a pretty high level about the paper. I need to do that, and then I will um, say this is the third time I think a big crunch has come to the board. So I can go and stand the substance of what you've been doing and the areas that you've been focusing on. So if you could um, pull out any particular things you want to make sure the board is aware of. Great. I will just quickly highlight it. So the directors know we've got a number of the team online, so the te technical experts and the team online. We've also got Suzanne joining us from the comms team, so the questions about the comms and the consultation that's been undertaken today, she's able to help with that. And Nathan will come back. And Nathan is our program manager who um, came on board off the tranche one and has done a great job at pulling all the different moving parts together and I think has been instrumental in ensuring a real cohesive and constructive <coughs> way forward on our team program. So uh, at a high level, maybe I'll just run through a, a, a few key notes. Um, I'm not going to run through the history. I think the board are aware of the history. This is the third time, actually the fourth, that we changed the 26 roads we changed in north and west after tranche one. Um, this particular tranche is our largest to date tranche of change. It is effectively constituting the same volume or size of network as we did in the tranches one and two. So one and two covered 19% of the network. This tranche in and of itself covers 19% of the network. Um, so it's a large, it's a large change. 1,600 roads, a little over 1,600 roads, representing about 1,400, a little over 1,400 kilometres as well um, across Tamaki Makoto. Um, I, I did, and, and, and Scott has already touched on it, and perhaps I won't labour it too much, but I think it is important to at least acknowledge that post our changes in tranche one, which came into effect on the 30th of June, we've been doing the monitoring and evaluation, as, as I've alluded to, and what we're seeing in terms of the results, Scotty's made some comparisons there um, year on year with DSR reduction. We've been looking specifically at those roads that we implemented changes around since June 2020. Um, and what we're seeing, there's some notes in the, in, in the, in the report, but a 30% reduction in fatalities in, in two years, across two years, um, following those changes, and a reduction in injury crashes of 25% overall, which is, which is really significant. Darren, to your, to your earlier point, are we patting ourselves on the back too soon? I, I don't think we should be patting ourselves on the back. I think it, at least the stats are moving in the right direction. Acknowledge that COVID has had, has had an impact, and I think it initially had a good impact. And then it's had yeah. a bad impact, yeah. and I think we're moving back towards, I would argue, almost a state of normality um, in terms of traffic patterns anyway uh, on the network. Um, but but I think it's important to acknowledge that the trend where we've made speed limit changes is absolutely heading in the right direction. That's what the monitoring and evaluation is telling us, and we'd be more concerned, or we'd be extremely concerned, if it was heading the other way. Um, so not patting ourselves on the back, but at least acknowledging that we're going the right way. I think it's important to, to call out that you know we've, we've been and consulted on this large scale change, phase three. Um, we received 8,622 submissions, so a large number of submissions. A lot of passionate Aucklanders out there who have views and opinions around speed, really good views and opinions. Um, I, I know that, that those submissions have been well interrogated. We've looked at them. And Wayne, if I come back to some of your comments earlier, uh, we saw a lot of feedback coming out of the Lee community. We put a lot of time and effort into working with that community after receiving their feedback. Uh, and Suzanne can talk a little bit more and Nathan can talk more to that if you would like. We have proposed, as a result of that, we went and commissioned a further review. So Becca did a further review of particularly those areas in Lee where we were getting the feedback from the community. And we have made some changes as a result of that feedback and that, that peer review that was undertaken, the second peer review, I might add, of the proposal that we had for the Lee area. Um, overall, following consultation, we're looking to make changes on 36 of the roads that we've gone out with proposed changes on. 
Uh, those are all outlined in the report. I won't go through them. I'm happy to, to, to go into more detail on those if, if the board has questions around those, but we are proposing to make changes around 36 rates. While that's not a large proportion when you consider the scale, that's probably the largest proportion of change we've made to date in any of the tranches. Um, so we have taken the feedback. I feel that we've taken the feedback on board seriously, uh, and we are making changes that reflect some of what we've heard from those communities. Um, I think probably my last points that I'd like to make is that this would be the last time that we'll be coming to the board to make speed limit changes under the bylaw because the law has changed. Um, so any future speed limit changes will be done or undertaken as part of our speed management plan. And we'll be coming back to the board later in the year with respect to that speed management plan, which, as you probably know, covers another 30 to 40 percent of our network between 23 and the years 23 and 26. So we're hoping to get back to the board later in the year uh, on that plan. But this will be the last time we come and use the bylaw to make changes to speed limits across the region. Um, and perhaps I'll leave it there and I'll just check in with Nathan Suzanne. Is there anything you guys wanted to highlight before we open it to the board for questions that I might have missed or? Andrew, I'm just for, just for oh, just time. Yes. Okay, well, let's leave it there, Chief. But, and this is something that's been missed. Okay, um, could I uh, now have any questions, please? <coughs> All right, um, I'm happy with this as well. I'm happy to support um, what the council heard on this one. Um, talk about positioning this and communication. We've had 8,500 submissions. Mm -hmm. Have you got any, you got a number in terms of the hours involved in preparing the bylaw, carrying out the consultations, evaluating the feedback, coming up with the alternative? How many hours do you spend? What's the board going to do? We, we have had this in a, in a previous paper. Um, from memory, it was a kind of six or seven thousand hours when we talked about the phase at the end of last year. I think this will be slightly more, so probably in that kind of seven to ten thousand hours range. Um, I would say that this this work is really the culmination of probably 24 months worth of work by our road safety engineering team and our kind of constant engagement team and the wider program team. So it's um, yeah, it's, we've been looking at this stuff since late 2020, and really, as Andrew probably alluded to, really sweating the detail on some of these areas because the, the changes are um, yeah, it can be quite polarizing, and just make sure that we have the right, the, um, I guess, decision making um, that we know we're compliant with legislation, that the police are comfortable with where we're going with it. And, and then also the communities and some of our local boards, um, even if they don't 100% uh, agree with all of the changes, at least they understand and they're kind of looking for why. Uh, this is the eight and a half thousand submissions, that's thousands of community hours have gone into this. I think, I think we should be open with the effort that's been put in mm -hmm. in response, just, just to get you away from 80 doesn't listen to submissions. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. This is big volume, uh, you know, it's an expensive process, a lot of people took a lot of time. Uh, into it. Um, really important to get across the, the benefits that's coming out of the speed reduction program. And I, I don't mind throwing in some comparisons between Plymouth and Bowen and the rest of the country if that works. Because one's going one way, the other's going the other. So it's, it's, um, yes, some people measure measure speed reduction as a cost to them and they perceive more time of travel, but you can get across the message eventually. But there is a cost that's a worthwhile cost um, because it's, you know, it's, it's saving um, injury and, and death. I suppose my third question is with the context of going out with this plant, which is big as the one is is it the right time just to be saying more about the volume of user count given the other research that we've been doing? Um, saying, well, actually, the, the official crash records don't, don't half capture the, what's yeah, going okay. on, particularly in the urban areas. And just uh, I mean, it came to it sort of highlighted for me reading uh, what's going on in, in Howie yeah. and sort of the, the denial, the other pockets of denial as, as well. I'm just wondering whether it's time to bring out that wider view. Is actually we we know we know that this will have a big effect on all the views that just put that on the table, Madam Chair. Yes, um, I'll put it just very quickly, Chair, and um, building on what um, Wayne just referred to, I, I, I think this is a 
a really major significant um, uh, positive outcome uh, for the organisation. And, and I'm just sort of um, uh, developing that the, the theme around uh, how this is actually positioned. And, and I don't think we should be positioning it as um, uh, has been shown uh, before in a self-congratulatory sort of way, but it's a really polarising issue. Eight and a half thousand submissions has taken up a lot of resource time and effort, but the numbers don't like the results, uh, you know, uh, are very positive. I just wondered if our comms could be, you know, about changing the, um, uh, the perceptions of speed and contributing to that whole um, uh, debate that this does work and uh, regardless of what the position on it is, uh, the, the reduction of, you know, according to this report, page 51, 30% plus uh, reduction of fatalities uh, or get other contributing factors uh, should um, be part of that uh, changing of societal sort of viewpoints on speed. Yeah. So it's probably more, more about, you know, a, a common strategy around this in due course. Uh, just to that point, I just want to answer that. Sure. We, we do, and so we write a letter to everybody that's um, who's in the area where they're going to get a new speed limit, um, and we lay out all the proof points. So people, so it is an education piece, and so we continue yes. to, you know, update um, with the new figures and, and, and be showing those in all our communications, all our direct communications. Uh, so Karen and then Kylie. I just wanted to acknowledge the amazing amount of work that's gone into this and fantastic. I love the um, engagement that's happened. I was privileged enough to be on the panel and hearing it. And as you say, really constructive. It sounds like we've really listened. I'd really like us to think about how we show that in the comms. And I think a little bit to your point um, around compliance, if there is some just building on other things, if we can show we've already got a community. We've got the stats, and I think we should shout loudly about the stats of the benefits that we've already, and I think there's great stats there, and the roads in particular that we've already reduced speeds. We should use all of that. And if people are already complying to the speeds, that's a good sign as well that people are accepting of it. So I think there's a lot of positive messages and how we should take this back to the public. So well done, congratulations. I think it's a fantastic piece of work. Um, thank you very much. Just want to endorse what Darren's just said. Um, and I am seeing coming through the continuous improvement and lessons learned from the. <coughs> I just want to double check for my own, um, I guess, peace of mind is when we have gone away from our recommendations and listened to our community, which is our communities, which is really good. We've talked about that we may then look at further reductions at a later time. Where we've landed, are we comfortable that they are still safe and what's the appropriate. appropriate? Yes. Um, I believe we are. Nathan, do you want to do you want to comment any further on that? Yeah, we, we are. I guess in, in terms of which speaks to the lead community. Yeah. Um, I think Wayne touched on, on it earlier. Like after really talking a number of times to community members, um, we talk, we kind of felt it was almost like a intermediary position where okay. it would take a couple of years as we work towards this ultimate safety appropriate speed. So it's uh, ultimately in all our urban areas, especially around like a little town centre or yeah. in a rural town centre, um, 30 kilometres an hour has the best safety for yeah. all those other vehicles yeah. and that's where we need to get to. Um, but legislation allows us to take, um, I guess, a staged approach. That's what I wanted to get up to. Okay. And that's what we're doing. Okay, that's cool. I think just quickly, if I may, in response as well, uh, when we came to the board with the, the last tranche of speed yes. change phase two, there was quite a bit of resistance, you'll remember, from Franklin. Yes. And, and in fact, we agreed to go away and do some more work with Franklin. And Nathan, it's probably helpful just to comment on how that's played out. Um, you know, because I think I think that was again our response to consultation after the fact. What we learned through phase okay, three. Yeah. So are you happy to do that? Yeah, I can do it. I can do it. There's probably two almost two pieces to it. One one is what we've done in response to the I guess from like the board's feedback and, and also probably how the changes have gone in practice as they're actually now in place. <coughs> with regards to Franklin local board, so we, we met with local boards and program team, uh, talked through the economic hot list um, of issues and identified the ones and we actually added in a few of the roads that were on their mind um, to go and investigate potential 
engineering changes. And so that's out with the consultancy at the moment, kind of working through the options and looking at the feasibility. Um, and we haven't gone back to the local board yet, but the view is when a, I guess, new, new local board is formed after um, local body elections, we're going to pull, pull together how this will um, I, th I think in practice, the changes have gone actually really smoothly. Um, so there was one road where um, uh, local board deputy chair Angela came back with some questions around some of the signage locations, and we went to look at that and confirmed that was a, a accurate and appropriate. Um, but we've had actually very little issue from any of the, the changes we've made in June and July. And I think maybe it comes to the fact that um, you know people are aware these changes are coming. We've done a huge amount of messaging, and um, you know maybe not everything's perfect, but I feel like we're kind of getting it right in terms of the speed limits that are out there. Thank you. Okay, we've got a series of recommendations. Um, I have a Darren and Benjamin Wayne. Uh, if that's agreed by the board. Thank you. Um, great work. Let's now move on to um, the financial insurance committee report. This one, if you like, in, in Andrew Downey's absence. Yes. That's okay. No, I forgot to do it. Yeah. You know, I've been reading them in the sale of the subject of the charter. Uh, pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. It's been through the committee. Um, pretty well. Okay. okay. Any questions or comments? Any other recommendations in there? Please be back. Thank you. That's agreed by the board. Yes. Thank you. Uh, moving now on to the business report. So, um, Madam Chair, we're going to have an overview of the new payments this month. Do you have any questions? So, this is. SOI measures this year and five new supporting measures that we're including in the report. Um, so these supporting measures have been included as a result of conversation about the SOI um, at, the, at the June board meeting. Um, and they're meant to provide regular visibility on travel patterns and trends within Auckland's vehicle fleet. Um, these new measures can be found on pages 8, 9, and 23 of the monthly engagement report. Um, so the three new SOI measures are estimated transport greenhouse gas emissions, um, which is reported quarterly, so it will be reported in the September monthly engagement report for that. Um, and then we have a new section in the monthly engagement report for Māori wellbeing. Um, so the two measures, SOI measures in there, are the percentage of regional buses with Tobacco bilingual announcement and number of months in there fully held. Um, and then we have the five supporting measures, which are Auckland fuel sales, Auckland state highway vehicle kilometres travel and, um, every month. Um, the actual number and the proportion of vehicles imported and registered in Auckland monthly. And then the share of electric vehicles in Auckland's vehicle fleet. Um, so additionally to that, um, in the July 2022 monthly report, um, so there were 4.8 million uh, PT boardings, which was above the trajectory to meet the SOI target by 3.4%. Um, July, on average, is usually lower than May and June because of the summer holidays um, and the winter holidays as well. Um, but overall, this indicates a steady improvement in line with the target of patronage on the PT network. And also, um, just hearing that speaks up as well, there's uh, the death and serious injuries on local roads, all Auckland roads, and for vulnerable road users are decreasing and all on track to um, be better than their targets. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Um, back to the final um, 
point. Um, we've got, um, so it's great to see these new indicators um, with respect to transfers uh, emissions in the fleet. Um, it's headed to improving resilience and sustainability of transport system approach, which I think is probably related to the um, uh, GPs activity, uh, regional land transport um, objectives, but it did seem to me it was significantly more important than improving resilience of the transport system, which is uh, uh, transport emissions. Uh, that basically is, a, um, is an incredibly important uh, and it's great to see the, to be able to actually see what's happening in terms of health, um, our impact on the gas and the greenhouse gas emissions and things that we do. So well known for the whole series of, of um, indicators together. Now, our comments and questions for you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the information on terms of how our corridors are working and where the public transport catchment is happening. Is there, how hard is it to pull out perhaps around um, North Shore as a centre, Manukau as a centre, um, rather than the CBD? Because we've got, we know there's less people coming to the CBD and that's driving a lot of the stats, but it's really hard to pick up. Does that mean there's I mean, our economy is going well, we're working reasonably well, apart from the CBD. So, are we seeing different patterns of growth emerging from different regions? Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. Uh, yes, I think that's the case, uh, Wayne. Unfortunately, I don't have that information readily to hand, but we can bring it next time um, with some analysis on how are the different patterns of patronage take up playing out on a spatial basis. I think that will provide some useful additional insight. So apologies that I can't give you the full information. Uh, uh, that would be helpful. Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a change happening around the world in terms of where things are happening. So. Mm -hmm. Um, just to build on Adrian, the fact that we've got these new indicators around turf and our goals, I think it'd be really interesting. Some of them are leading indicators, like imports on new hybrid vehicles. I'm just wondering, like, is that 39% of our new registrations as hybrids or EVs in line with what we're forecasting for turf in terms of fleet change by 2030? I just think we need really cool data that can feed through and help us understand the changes better. Stick measurement is not how many are coming in, but how many are still on the road. Because mm. yeah. total fleet management, but yeah. it, yeah. but is he right that there is a that there must be a rate of yeah. um, of new vehicles coming in in order to change the whole mix of the fleet? Mm. Mm. That's right. Really understand one of the assumptions right now. Yeah. We can, you know, we can put those kinds of trajectories into the uh, material. We're also looking to get a percentage of total fleet that is um, EV or hybrid, so that'll help, um, you know, add, add some more value to this overall data. So you're happy to work to get some trajectory figures in. Yeah. Which, which look, this is the first time. That will be a few months, but it's a fantastic start, um, including the fact that we have, for some reason, we've had a reduction in emissions over the last 12 months, 10%, which might presume is the last Well, I, sorry, again, through the witness at the end of chair. Um, of course, COVID, uh, the, the lockdown processes, because those are rolling 12 month averages, they're picking up those impacts. And as you say, your person hands. Okay. So let's not um, get too excited about that. Oh, okay. It used to be that the majority of new, new vehicle introduction of the fleet came through business vehicles. Is that still the case? It's a mixture. It's a mixture of it. Darren, we'll come back to the wax session. 
Just a quick one on the very last page, 262, around our partnering, collaborative uh, partnering with our funders and our local body members. I understand that this is a survey that's only done on an annual basis currently, and I just wondered whether there was merit or reason for us to do this maybe more regularly with all the change that's about to be upon us as we get a better sense of how to do this better and have a better baseline. Um, I just wonder whether annually right now might not be enough. Maybe to do so. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just leave that comment um, with you. Um, I think this, this, this area could actually do with a bit of a deep dive. Um, because it's probably there are probably a lot of issues about um, budget and the inability to meet aspirations, yeah. which get rather conflated with how often we talk to people and answer questions. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes to hear no. I know you've got a pretty good time. Just, I just thought the dashboarding and the information was fantastic. You can read this and understand exactly where we're at. It's very, very, very good. I'm going to follow up on that. The alarming stat on 234 is a very service punctuality is down 8% due to vessel availability. So I'd like to know a bit more about how we have enough vessels or are they broken in or what's actually happening with vessel availability. But it's a big big shift down. There's a number of aspects to, to the problem. One is to do with the staffing to run the vessels. Um, which is, is probably the key driver uh, and we're working with Fullers on that to uh, support them to recruit more staff and it relates to the point that Mark made earlier around immigration uh, issues. That's probably the key underlying issue at the moment but going forward we do have a plan around vessel procurement for Auckland Transport itself to try and in the long run really resolve this issue for uh, I think that we we will we will come to the issue about about Baltimore. We've got a huge issue with uh, ability to recruit uh, and particularly Perry in the oh, it's not vessel availability, it's the people driving the vessels. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so look this is um uh, thank you very much um for your excellent summary. So that's, um, if there's no general business, so that um, concludes the uh, open session of the Auckland Transport Board.